the expert landlord. And as you can guess, we'll be talking about everything a landlord probably needs to know about managing their property. Now, you might be at home and perhaps you have a residential property. Maybe it might even be rented out, but you're still not quite sure how to best maximize your um, investment property. That's where David comes in. He'll be helping us understand the different ways that as landlords, we can maximize our investment properties, but also some of the things that we definitely need to know as we navigate our rental investment. David, thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you. So, I mean, David, one of the things that a lot of us uh, landlords, uh, you know, do when we start off and and I, I'm going to confess that I also did this. And I'm, as many viewers at home are probably picking up, I've also made my fair share of mistakes along the way. And I think many of us probably learn like that, but you don't always have to make some of those mistakes. Some of them are actually quite avoidable. And that is to start off and not look at your investment property like a business. I mean, I started off, you buy properties and you think you want to own multiple properties and you want to rent them out, but you don't really look at it as a business. You don't run it as a business. You know, David, why is it so important to not only look at it as a business, but also to actually run it like a business? Well, I mean, ultimately, uh, a business is a product or a business is an organization that provides a product or service in exchange for money from a supplier to a customer. And that's what you're doing as a property investor. You've got a, a very expensive asset, 400, 500,000, a million rand. It's a lot of money. It's worth a lot. And uh, just on a stewardship perspective, you'd want to look after it to make sure that uh, it's still worth something in years to come. But um, a business perspective means that you're running it like a business, means that you are the uh, organization providing accommodation. So you, the organization of the property investor, are providing accommodation to your customer who's a tenant for, in exchange for money, which is the rent. And also you're also providing utilities and maybe a parking bay or, or something like that. And it makes sense that the better service you give to your customer, the tenant, the better return you're going to get or, or better results you're going to get from your, from your uh, investment. So, yeah, I mean, and, and I think from a long term perspective, a business perspective gives you the right attitude as to how to handle things and how to approach things. It gives you a pragmatic view in, in uh, you want to win the long term uh, war, not just the not just a single battle. So it helps you with negotiations. It helps you look at the bigger picture that uh, you need to treat your, that your role players, whether it's your suppliers, your maintenance man, um, uh, with, with, professional, with professionalism. It also means that you want your administration under control. Every yeah. good business runs good operations. They run good administration. Is your paperwork in order? Have you got your lease agreement in writing uh, with your tenant? You know, getting the basics in, in place. And I, and I must admit, David, I mean, one of the things I'm quite terrible at is my admin. Uh, and oftentimes when tax season comes, my, uh, <laughs> my accountant borderline wants to kill me because she, she'll always be running after me about, you know, I need X, Y, Z. I know you did this on the property. Where is this, you know, invoice? And oftentimes she, she battles with me because I'd say, this is the part that I'm not that great at. So even keeping record of, all the things, all the money that you spend, all the money that's coming in with each and every, you know, investment property that you have is so important. And I know I've struggled. I mean, I've now created the, 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 the Google form, what is this, Google Drive, and you kind of put every property by itself and everything that I do with every property, I try to put it in there. But even that admin just seems so tedious. But retrospectively, I see how much money I probably um, you know, mess up on as far as my taxes are concerned. Luckily, I have a really brilliant accountant who is quite efficient and is able to help me um, with that process. But if I didn't even have that, I probably would have struggled quite significantly. So I think one of the things is when you then begin to run it like a business, you'll make sure that you keep tabs on all the administrative elements as well, because you're not just going to look at it as, oh, there's that side thing that I have, you know, it's just one rental property, it's just two but you'll take it seriously from day one. Yeah, I mean, you, you, won't be able to, you won't be able to buy a third or fourth property if you aren't getting the basics right with your first property. And that's a good business principle. Yeah. You, you learn to walk before you learn to run. So um, I think the main thing is to get better at it over time, like you have, as opposed to think you're going to get it perfect yeah. upfront. And it took us years 
get our systems and our business up and running correctly. But, but from a filing perspective, it's very simple. I'm not the greatest filing person myself. Luckily, I'm married to someone who is. But um, it's very simple. You have all the information around your property, a property. Um, and then separately to that, or in the same big folder, you have a folder on each tenancy. So mm -hmm. each new tenant you put in that, in that file, and you just put all the documents for that one tenant in, uh, with that property file. And that's, a, that's the best way to, 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 you know, to, test, to set up your framework. So I'll make sure that I, uh, uh, when I decide to get married, I'll make sure I marry somebody who's more efficient <laughs> with their admin than I am. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not, I've, re I've accepted that I'm not going to win that battle. It's, it's just, it's above me now. <laughs> I just keep it moving. So I think I need to be partnered with somebody who's, who's quite efficient in their administrative tasks. But David, you know, to also then look at some of the other things that um, a landlord needs to be mindful of. One of them, of course, is going to be tenant screening. Can you take us through tenant screening? It's super important. Now, I just want to say one thing. We all, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? Uh, the, the, the reason why the quality of your tenant is going to determine the, the, the amount of money you're going to get in consistently through the period of release. And a good tenant is going to look after your property. But let's, the, the one caveat I just want to put in, uh, you know, just put up front is that it's easy to say in theory, why are we sitting at home watching this, uh, this episode? We can say, oh, of course, we need to get a great tenant. But let's think about the 30th of the month and you haven't yet found a property a tenant for your property. Now what? A tenant comes to you and a tenant is saying, well, you know what? Let's see how the first month goes and then we'll sign the paperwork after that. You know, and when you're desperate and you've got a bond to pay the next day, just be very careful to rather make sure, um, maybe get a short-term loan to cover the bond for that month, but don't, don't be pressurized by the situation to place any tenants. So I just want to put that caveat in, in because it's easy to say in theory, in practice, uh, we need to make sure that we um, are, are protecting ourselves. But screening a tenant, it's basically what you, uh, a quality tenant. Uh, can I just say what a quality tenant is and the tenant yeah. we look for? So we're looking for a tenant who, who pays well. And what we mean by paying well is a tenant that pays in full, on time, and every month. So a tenant that pays in full every second month is not a good payer. It must mm. be every month and it must be in full. So a tenant that pays their rent but doesn't pay utilities is not a good tenant. So that's the first thing is that you want a tenant, a, full, a, 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 a good paying tenant. And the second thing is you want a tenant uh, that looks after your property well. And, and those are the two main factors. And I mean, you, you know, as you're speaking, uh, David, it actually reminded me of one of our guests in our previous episodes who had highlighted that a bad tenant is actually more expensive than uh, no tenant. Because oftentimes a lot of uh, landlords think, let me just get uh, the person, it's me, I'm maybe going on my second month, um, whoever comes along, I'll just put them in. And as opposed to perhaps sitting down and evaluating if, for example, your price point is at the right level, perhaps you've overpriced your property, um, maybe you should rather go down, whether it's 200 or 500 rands, um, assess whether uh, you're marketing to the right people, perhaps you, you're not posting your ads in the right places. So you're, you've got a, an apartment, say, in Santon, but the places where you're placing your ads, that target market doesn't actually go to those websites. Um, and that's where, you know, resources like privateproperty.co.za come in handy because you're able to place whichever, well, you know, you're able to place your, um, your property regardless of which area you actually have. And when people search, then they actually go to that specific area. So you don't have to scrabble and think, oh, maybe I haven't placed it in the right place. So using credible platforms uh, like ours becomes so important. And then assessing. So you go into privateproperty.co.za and let's say you're in Santon, you look at Santon and let's say you're in uh, in Rosebank in particular, then you see, okay, the average two bed is going for 11,000, but you've placed yours at 15,000. The reason why you're not renting out is because there, there's quite a big gap or quite a number of properties from that 11,000 to 15,000. So being able to assess the other issues that um, could be the reason why you're actually not uh, letting out your property is probably more important than putting in the first person that you find because trying to evict a bad tenant is such a costly exercise and it simply just doesn't have to get there. Yeah, no, 100%. And by the way, I'm talking about private property. We get excellent results with private property, by the way. And I did a, we, we did a, an analysis just this last week 
as yeah. to give us the best results. And yeah. um, you'll know that um, private property hit the top of the pops. Um, and I'm, gen I'm genuinely saying that because I, we did an analysis the other day um, and the guys, get, my team gave me the figures. So uh, awesome stuff. But I, I think it's really important that you, that you uh, uh, the, first, the first point in, in look, you know, look, uh, placing a great tenant is to make sure that you, you're doing proper marketing and that the pictures you're putting up on, on private property are the best possible quality and that you're pricing it well. Pricing in this market is terribly important. Mm -hmm. super, super important. And if you're overpricing your property, the kind of tenant that you're going to attract, um, tenants are pretty wise people and they're going to, um, let me put it this way, a, a professional tenant will not go for an overpriced property, but a dodgy tenant will. Okay. So they won't actually ask questions. So you also need to be quite careful of that. Uh, if you're joining us on at home, uh, this is of course the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamando Kumalo. And tonight I'm speaking to David Beatty, who is the author of The Expert Landlord. And we're looking at everything that every landlord should know about property management. Now, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to send them and I'll be asking them to David. And David, we already have a few questions coming in. And one of them was actually something that I wanted us to have a look at and it's coming from Michael van Nieker, who's asking how would one screen a tenant post the pandemic? Uh, their payment record would not reflect their true pre payment ability. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, the, the, the pandemic hasn't been that long. Mm. Uh, even if we're looking at a month's time, that payment record will show immediately from the end of March. And in my view, the end of March payment is, for us, it was 95% as good as normal because most people were paid a salary in March. Yeah. So you may have a bit of a challenge uh, from the first May um, uh, payment. But other than that, uh, the tenant's history is pretty much going to be well extended beyond the period of the, uh, of the, of the lockdown. Um, and second of all, a, a, a professional tenant will provide a data or a document stating that they didn't get paid during the period of the lockdown. So it'll be pretty clear um, through your screening process that you, will, that you will be able to get the right information about that quality tenant. And I mean, I, I actually saw uh, TPN data coming in, uh, they're showing it today, that I think it's 32% of residential tenants have not paid their April um, rent. And they're possibly, you know, projecting that it's going to be more for May. So we do realize that we in relatively unprecedented times right now, and perhaps some of those tenants may have either lost their jobs. I think we've seen uh, over a million South Africans losing their jobs or having their pay being reduced. So you almost need to take an informed decision when you're assessing tenants post the pandemic. Um, and of course, we don't know how long this period is going to last. So even if lockdown you know, ends when we currently think it's going to end or gets extended, chances are there's still going to be economic you know, ramifications for other businesses. So tenants are going to be affected. So I suppose as a, as a landlord, you're also going to be assessing other factors when you're screening um, a tenant. But David, I actually want us to, to spend a, a little bit more time with the tenant screening because some people, for example, you might want to do it alone, suppose as a, as a landlord, or you might outsource it to a rental agent who's helping you and you're probably going to pay them whether it's that six or seven percent or that one month's rental. What are some of the things, if, for example, you're doing it by yourself, what are some of the things that you're looking at? So, of course, you ask for the payslip, finding out where they work, but what are actually some of the factors that you look in that help you make an informed decision about whether or not somebody could potentially be a good tenant or not? So, you're looking for, the, uh, uh, to go back to the criteria of a good tenant, you're first of all looking for a tenant that has the ability to pay. So, what you want to do is look for, first and foremost, look at their incomes. Uh, is, is income at least three times what the rent amount is? If it is, you can go to the next stage and now you can check the salary slip um, that the money that the salary slip says is going out every month is actually arriving in the bank account. So you need to check the bank statements and you check that the, the money is actually going in. On those bank statements, you want to check that the expenses going out is not more than that income. And typically a tenant um, is renting, uh, renting another property prior to renting yours. So you can then see a monthly rent payment going through and you can see when that rent payment is actually being made. So that'll give a pretty good history, um, the last three months bank statement. Just on why we're talking about documents, um, can I just, for a private landlord, is to go in with open eyes and expect that there is fraud. We, we reckon about one out of four to one out of six um, applications has got fraudulent documents in it. So really don't, 
I'm the kind of person that typically expects the best of everyone I meet. But when you do a tenant screening, um, kind of take those filters off your, um, your eyes and really screen expecting the worst. And then you can then see what are fraudulent documents and what are not. Um, and then lastly, you want to phone the, uh, the employer to confirm that in fact they work at that, pro that, pop um, at that company. Um, the second thing you want to do is check the behavior of the tenant. Um, and you're going to do that by phoning uh, the previous landlord and landlords prior to the previous landlord or to the existing landlord. So you're going to phone two or three of the previous landlords for references. Number one, did they pay on time? And, how, and number two, how did they behave? And how was, you know, how did they look after the property? About, um, just on the one point, going back to the, the payment ability, obviously your will do a TPN, uh, uh, tenant profile, uh, a credit bureau check. And any private landlord can do that just as much as an agency can do it. And, and I'm sure then, Obakeng, um, that answers your question. Obakeng Mohane had actually asked a very similar question around the best way to go about screening your tenant. Now, David, another thing then that's important, you've screened your tenant, you've got your checklist, and you're now sure that perhaps this is the right tenant. They sign, um, you, you, you having a conversation with them, they want to move in. What should the landlord be doing next? Because I know one of the things that's important is to always have everything in writing. It's not good enough after that person has met the criteria to say, okay, so you'll be moving in and here's your, you know, here are the keys. Why is it so important to make sure that all the paperwork is done and is done properly? So you want to set your tenancy up for success. So the better foundation you lay at the beginning, at the tenant move in, the better chance you have of success for the remainder of the lease and when the tenant moves out. So a couple of things, you want the lease agreement in writing. That's the agreement and the contract between the landlord and the tenant. And if you got that um, and you need it in, you must, I would highly recommend that you put it in writing. You've then got a neutral document which both parties are obligated to fulfill. So it's not only you going to the tenant and say, you need to pay my rent, you need to do this and this and this and this. You also can say to the tenant, but I've also committed as a landlord to a variety of things which is listed on that lease agreement. The second thing you want to do is make sure that the money is in your bank account before you hand over keys. Make sure it's in a bank account. There is a lot of stress that your tenant's about to move in. They've got the move-in truck outside the, the premises, and, uh, but you haven't got your money yet. Please don't be pressurized in handing over keys until the money is reflecting your, in your bank account. Um, you will, once you've made that mistake once, you will never make it again. Um, <laughs> you speak like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Um, talking about making mistakes, I think we, we've joined the weed, but we're all part of the same club. Uh, yeah. But, and, then, and then a very important thing is to do a joint move-in inspection with the tenant. Now, a, a yes. move-in inspection is the way you do it is that you've got a document which lists every room in the, in the property. You go through the property and I tend to do it on myself before the tenant is there. I do it prior to the tenant arriving and I write down all the marks and issues with the walls, the floors, the roof, the, the ceiling, et cetera, et cetera. And I list it on there. So the, the reason why I'm doing that is because that is my master kind of copy. On the tenant move out, whatever doesn't reflect, whatever is over and above normal wear and tear, and what is over and above the marks and issues that are already shown in the property, I can then charge a tenant damages off the tenant's deposit. So, and it's important that you do a joint move-in inspection. So now that the tenant arrives, you walk around the property with the tenant and going through all your comments, and while you talk going around the property with your tenant, you want to talk about your expectations. This is what I expect from you as a tenant. This is about the property. This is how to do the refuse. This is, this is how the utilities are charged. And, um, and Mr. Tenant, this is what I'm going to provide for you as a landlord. At the end of that inspection, you want, to, you want a, uh, the tenant to sign the, that inspection report. So both parties sign the, that inspection report. And in the next day, I would uh, send a copy of that inspection report to the tenant for their records. Now you've got a document at the end of the lease agreement, which um, means that there's, there's much less chance of arguments. The number one issue um, that the rental housing tribunal experiences is uh, disputes over deposits. And in my view, that's more than 99% of the time should not happen if you've done a proper move-in inspection. 
And that's such an important one. I think I, so luckily that's the one mistake I haven't made. Um, I think of all the mistakes tonight that I, I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, confessing to, that's the one I can assure people I haven't actually made. And that was because I used um, a rental agent and they created that snag list. And in the event where they first actually inspected the property themselves, um, and said, we are seeing that these are some of the issues that might come up. So as the landlord, they advise that I probably fix those first before a tenant moves in, just so the wear and tear doesn't get, um, just so it doesn't get more damaged. And so that the next person who moves in, moves into a place that doesn't have issues. And then by the time a tenant comes in, there essentially isn't anything wrong and there's no snag list and they do an inspection, they move in, we sign. And by the time they move out, they also do an inspection. And in the event where something is broken they actually notify the tenant that this is what's happening you can fix it or if you want the landlord if you want to fall in the landlord then likely your um, deposit will be affected so that really is quite an important thing to be mindful of when you're a landlord now david there are questions that our viewers at home are sending of course if you want to send any um, questions to david um, do send them through and we'll be discussing them now we've got one again from Obagen Mohane who asks, I've previously done credit screening but still had a problem with the tenant paying. What other things can I look out for? Well, I think, um, I think, I think it still comes back to the tenant screening. I mean, you need to look at, uh, is there consistency in that income? If, they, if, they earn, if the rent is uh, three and a half thousand rand and they earn 12,000 rand uh, for one month, but the next month they earn 6,000 rand, you know, how consistent is that income? Also, I would really look at the history. The history is what provides the best information for the future. So you need to be doing, making sure that you're doing proper uh, um, reference checks on that tenant. We find that a good tenant, uh, you know, also um, sometimes a tenant, good tenants go through tough times. I mean, you're gonna get the classic experience going through it now. We, we're, predicting, uh, we're predicting very heavy times going forward for the next three to six months. And we're going, to, we're going to have some really good tenants that are going to struggle over the next period. So, so when, you, when you go to do your screening history with a tenant, look through, you might find that on the, on the TPN record that there's a whole lot of, or two or three credit his, uh, issues on one month in 2016. That might have been when they lost their job. Whereas if you look at the tenant history uh, and you look at, there's, a, there's a, um, a default every six months. Now that shows habitual behavior versus a once off losing your job. So look at that kind of thing. Look at context, delve deeper into that tenant. Bear in mind, you've got a 500,000 rand or a million rand asset. If you go to the bank and get bond finance, the bank is going to ask a lot of questions and you need to provide a lot of paperwork for the, for, for the bank. Yeah. You're no different uh, as a landlord. You've got to make sure you're doing your, your, your screening very super uh, carefully. Our credit department in our, in our company, I think they they're worse than the bank sometimes. Uh, and it's quite frustrating, but it means in the long term, well, it's frustrating in a good way. And I've learned not to put my finger in that pie when, when it comes to our credit experts, because in the long term, it means that we have very few evictions. In, we, we have, in fact, we hardly know what an eviction is because you, your screening is that important. And so David, another question coming in this time from Bupilo uh, CT is, my tenant only notified me through WhatsApp messages that she's not getting her April salary. What should I request to prove that she's being honest? Well, um, look, t the first thing is that tenants are obligated to pay their rent. And the president's been very clear on that. And, and all of us need to be professional. However, some tenants are going through difficulty and if they can prove that they're going through difficulty, then I think the landlord should work with that tenant and make and work out a plan, either to maybe use a deposit, and that's that's a, that's a decision. I don't want to go too technically into that legal side of things, but or otherwise have a payment arrangement with the tenant. But what we provide is, and you can get it. There's a free rental relief pack on the TPN website, and I yeah, highly recommend it. Yeah. Super important, super useful, and you provide, you send that document to the tenant, and you say, Mr. Tenant or Miss Tenant. If you fill these documents out and I get documents from your employer that's proving you've got struggling with your income, then we can then talk. But until that point, I am holding you liable for the rent. 
And I think, you know, I, I'm actually going to reiterate that, David, because we did speak to uh, Silna, uh, to Michelle Dickens, the MD of TPN. I think it was episode two, episode three. Um, so, I mean, if you're listening at home, do check out that particular episode. And that was really when we were talking about some of the relief that um, both tenants and landlords can seek during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And she did highlight how TPN has released uh, have done really great work, even with uh, SLLR, where they've essentially come up with this rental pack for landlords um, to have a conversation with their tenants in the event where they're not able to either pay their full rent or uh, pay any rent at all. So essentially now going to be getting into, we'll say, a new agreement, um, whether it's going to be staggering the rental payment or you're going to make use of the deposit. And all of this is professionally written down. It's an actual contract. Both parties must sign so that you know that after the crisis is over or in the next few months, both sides have this legally binding document that can help them um, have recourse for each other. Because I think it's also safeguarding both parties and not just the landlord. I think the tenant as well. It's important for them to also have that documentation because you don't want a landlord in three months time who said actually it's okay you can only pay 50% and you'll pay the, the remainder after three months to come back and say, actually, I agree that you're going to add 10% extra because of the late payment. So the terms and conditions then of, we'll say the new agreement or an agreement in place uh, talking about that particular period becomes so important. So if you did miss that episode, you can go to our YouTube channel and we've created a playlist with all the past episodes. Uh, like I said, I think it was episode two, episode three of the Private Property Podcast where we did speak on this. So if you're a tenant, you, if you're a landlord and you're already having issues with some of your tenants, I think do reach out to them. Um, it's free, so it's downloadable online. I actually went onto the TPN website to have a look at it and it's very easily accessible even the language that they've used is actually quite easy. It's just a matter of filling in, you know, your figures and obviously your, your details, and then you've got a new contract in place. Now, David, another, of course, important thing that every landlord needs to be mindful of, and I see that there are actually quite a number of questions coming in, and I'll um, go through them right now, is, of course, the issue of then... Um, sticking to the rules and this is the one that we essentially just covered now with you know we've got a new uh, agreement in place if you have an issue with your tenant but the importance of actually sticking to the rules so you've got this rental agreement this lease agreement in place and both parties essentially need to stick to the rules can you take us through that bit for a moment well i mean um I think sometimes where some landlords fall down is that they're not professional in the way they treat their tenant. They're not consistent. They're not, they're not accessible to the tenant for the issues and so forth. So as my mom would always say, um, uh, you've got to, you know, wipe your own nose first, um, clean your own nose first. So I just want to make that caveat is that we find, we find that professional landlords who are professional, um, tend to have less of the tenant issues than, than non-professional landlords. So, um, just bear that in mind. But other than that is question is communicate well with your tenant. If the tenant is breaching the lease, which, which means that they are going against some of the terms of the lease agreement and not acting in accordance with the lease agreement, then I, as a landlord would, should act very quickly and communicate professionally in writing to the tenant that they have breached a particular clause in the lease agreement. And in terms of the lease agreement, they've got X number of days in which to rectify their breach, but act quickly. And, and again, we, we have thousands of tenants and most of these kind of issues are not, you know, they dissipate. So some of the issues do become large issues. I'm not saying they don't, but a lot of it comes down to putting the right foundations in place, acting professionally, acting quickly. And then you find, say, eight or nine out of 10 of these issues tend to be sorted. Now, another, another thing, um, you know, that becomes quite important with, uh, with property management, certainly as a landlord, is the importance of being consistent, because uh, property management really is about getting those things right month after month. What are some of those things that you essentially need to be consistent about every month as a landlord? The first thing you want to do is make sure you're billing your tenant consistently, say around the 25th or the 26th of every month. Mm -hmm. Making sure that you're billing the correct rent amount, and in billing any utilities that may be charged in arrears, et cetera. And then the second thing you want to do on that is you want to check your bank statement on the first of the month to check that your, your amount is in. And then if the amount is not in, you're starting a debt collection process 
uh, conscientious and religiously from the, uh, the second of the month. So that's the first main thing. That's a, pretty much the main thing you've got to do from month to month. The other thing I would put in the diary is every six months or so uh, is to go buy the property, pop past the property and to do an, in, uh, an inspection. Every uh, single month? I would say every six months or so. Oh, six months. Oh, okay. okay. In the real world, you can go there every month or two, but three months go by very quickly. And to make it sustainable, we found that trying to get in inspections too often is just not sustainable. So it's rather not. have a... And I think it's also just invasive. I mean, if, if we're trying to go into... A, I mean, every month, I think, is a bit of a stretch. Perhaps yeah. once a quarter, that makes sense. So if it's a year-long lease... Uh, you're at least going to be seeing the place every quarter. And like you said, it does go by relatively quickly. Uh, I would suggest realistically for a long term, if you've got three or four or five properties, I would suggest if you diarize it for every six months, you're actually going to get it done. If you okay. two, um, you know, one, one property every quarter, that's fine. But four or five properties every quarter, I just don't think it's sustainable. Yeah. Now, David, before I let you go, any other tips um, that you think that every landlord should be aware of as they manage their rental property? I think you've been, I think you've been exceptional in touching uh, all the main points. Can I just leave you with the la one last comment? And um, if we can remember the word care, C-A-R-E. Now, those are the four main land needs of landlords that we've all got. The first need is C for cash flow. We want to make sure that we get the maximum money in and that's done through making sure that we have strong occupancy levels and good collections. The second thing is an A for asset. We want to make sure that our property is looked after. Um, and that is through good maintenance and through inspections. Remember, we're going through the four main needs of landlords. The C is for cash flow, which is your main need. Your first need, your second need is the A for asset, which is a condition of your property. And the third thing is reconcile, which is a, the administration around your property. Making sure, especially your utilities bills, your rates bills are up to date, that your filing is up to date. And the third, fourth thing a landlord wants, um, we, I've used the word exclusive, uh, E for exclusive, is peace of mind. We need peace of mind. You're not going to buy your second, third, fourth property if you don't have peace of mind as to how your first property is being run. So remember C-A-R-E for the four main needs of landlords. And every landlord has got these four main needs. And that's cash flow, asset, reconcile, and exclusive. David, yeah. thank you so much for joining us this evening. That is David Beatty, who is the author of The Expert Landlord. You can get his book if you want to find out more about how you can be a better landlord. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode, episode nine of the Private Property Podcast. I've been your host, Zamantung Kumalo. Here's to staying at home and staying safe, and we'll be back again tomorrow evening. Goodbye.